me that. There we go. There we go. That was a good one. All right. How are we doing today? It's so good. Hey, we have the kids in here today. Can I hear the kids say hello to me real quick? <laughs> They're not excited. Though. Hello. Hello. Hey, kids, I'm glad that you're here today. You know, what we do, if you don't know this, what we do on, uh, on the, there's certain months throughout the year that have a fifth Sunday. And what we do is we like to have the kids in service because they get to see baptism sometimes. They get to see us do communion. They get to see, they get to be a part of service with us. So it's really, I think it's important for us to do church together a lot of times. And so uh, when we do that, I'm excited for, for us walking this out together as a family. I think it's really, really beneficial. Uh, another, another cool bonus with that is all the amazing teachers that serve in the classrooms that get to be in service as well. Can we give them a hand? They do such an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you, teachers. I'm seeing you. Thank you. They, they, uh, they, they're discipling our kids. They're, they're feeding into the next generation. I love that. Thank you so much. And it gives them a, a, that, that, that Sunday off from doing that. They can be in here. Um, Last, let's see here, last week we had the, the last sermon in our series called the I Am series where Jesus has seven I Am statements. And uh, today, we, today we're starting, we're not starting a new series, to, or series today, we're starting, we're, we're, I just have a standalone sermon today out of Exodus chapter 33. So if you guys want to go there, I'm going to, it'll take me a little bit to get there real, real quick because uh, I want to talk about a couple things before, but. But we're going to look at Exodus chapter 33, grab your phones or your Bibles. I like it when people have a physical Bible. It's really good because then we get to learn, we get to feel, we get to know where, where things are in Scripture. So it's always good to have that. But grab, your, grab your, your things, your phones, whatever you've got. Exodus chapter 33, we're going to start at uh, verse 12 and we'll read on for a little bit and then, uh, and then um, we'll break it down for a little bit. But um, before that, last week... Or on Tuesday, we had the Brandon Heath concert here. How many of you guys were here for that? There's a lot of us. Wasn't that fun? That was so fun. Jason, J- Jason helped put, put that all together. Can we, can we just thank him for setting that up? Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much, man. There was, there was um, good food there, great music. I love Brandon Heath's ability to communicate stories. Um, it was a little warm, but it didn't matter. It wasn't that bad at all. And, uh, but the best thing that I like about it was we got to have community with other people. I had some really important conversations during that couple hours. It was fun to laugh and hang out, but I had some really important conversations. People sharing with me, man, I'm hungry for God's presence. I'm hungry for God. And it was really, for me, it was really, that, that, that's, that's important to hear. And, and for us to know that, a lot of times, some of you, you, you recognize there's a longing within you. And we have, to, we have to consider that could be God pulling us toward himself. So I want you to consider that. And, and so, so it was really great to hear that. There's a couple guys that, man, they're longing for God's presence. They're, they're longing to be in, communities, in community. And so I'm thinking about starting a couple new small groups this fall. If you're interested in that, let us know. Get a connect card that Armin was talking about. Fill it out. Or if you're interested in learning how to lead a group, maybe that's an interest. Don't worry, I'm not going to throw you in the deep end. But if you're int- slightly interested, let me know and, I, and w- we can talk about it. But I, I loved seeing that. Thank you, Jason, for creating that opportunity. Um, okay. So I think a lot of us can identify with this question. Am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I headed in the right direction? Right? How am I... How, how, how do, we, how do I know, how do we know that we're where, we're where God wants us? How do we know if, if we're doing the things that God is calling us to do? Right? As parents and spouses in here, some of you, some of you are not parents or spouses, but, but sometimes we, like, how do we know where, how we're doing within that? Young people, how do, how, do you, how, do you, how do you know you're headed in the right direction in your classes or career path or friendships or dating how do we know? How do I know? How do we know if we're stewarding the things that God has given us, the resources, the money, our time, our energy, those things? Am I using my life in a way that it honors God and in a way that in, in a way that it uses the gifts that God is calling you? How do we know? 
Am I depending on God's direction or am I leaning too much on my own understanding? Sometimes we have those questions. That's part of the reason why we come together to, ch- to go to church because we, we're, we're, we have those, a little bit of a longing, right? Thank you, Miss little miss over there. She said, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little vulnerable with you right now and uh, just some things that I'm struggling with. Intrusive thoughts that say, Angel, you're not doing a good, you're not a good pastor. And sometimes they come, sometimes they go. And, and, and uh, so I'm going to be vulnerable with you because I think it's important for us to be, to be transparent with one another. Right? And if you feel like after the message, if you feel like giving me like Thai food or cheesecake <laughs> or ice cream or if you want to Venmo me any money, I'm down with, I, I don't need it, but you can, I won't stop you either. <laughs> but I've been struggling with, with some of these thoughts. When it, comes to, when it comes to me as a pastor, but then also the church that I'm leading, like these just negative things come in. Last Sunday, uh, my neighbor Kevin died. And he's my, gosh, I didn't think I was going my, to. My friend Kevin died. Been wrestling with cancer for two years. And, and so there's mixed emotions with that. There's this. There's this sense of the relief because he's, he doesn't have any more pain. And then there's this anger towards death and, and, and illness. And, and, and then there's these thoughts of, Angel, did you, did you do enough to be in this man's life? He used to call me the priest of the neighborhood. <laughs> and it, man, that boy, that boy had a potty mouth on him. But he was, he was someone that, like, th- there was something genuine about him. He was a truth teller. And so when I think about it, I don't know. I don't know where he was and on his last moments, in his heart. I don't know where he was. And so the question comes in, Angel, do, do, do you represent enough? Did you pray enough? Did you share Jesus enough? And that plagues me. And so the question comes in, I don't know, or these voices, I don't know if they're mine or the enemies or what it is or it's a mixture. Is, Angel, do you? Are you make, you're not making an impact. And neither is your church. I'm like, man, I, I hate those thoughts. That's a strong word. I do not like those thoughts. And so there's not enough, you're not doing enough small groups. The, 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 the discipleship things aren't working. And we, we, you know, you don't have enough opportunities for young people. There's, you know, you should be at two or three different services by now. All these things come up and they just stir up this negative stuff in me. And, it, and, and they don't allow me to see the good things that God is doing in people's lives. Because there are a lot of really good things that are happening in people's lives. People are walking and heal, healing in a process of healing right now. Like I said a little bit ago, people are hungry for God's presence. There's young people who are saying, hey, let's start something up for young people. There's, there's a hunger there. Some high schoolers are saying, hey, let's create more opportunities for our friends that they could be a part of. And, in fact, there's like a, a bunch of students that are go, going off to camp in, the, in a couple of weeks. Right? There's people operating the gifts that God has given them. We see miracles happening. I got a, one of my favorite texts. I got it. Made, made my day. It says, see you tomorrow, brother. Favorite day of the week. I love that. Um, thank you for that. It's not about me. It's about him. It shows me that there's people that are hungry for, for God. So, so these negative thoughts mess with me. Am I, supposed to, am, I, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I headed in the right direction? Right? Are we walking out God's plan for us? Again, if you guys want to send me like some Thai food, I'm down for that. If you, to make me feel better, I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, they like type. I'm, I'm totally kidding. But I think Exodus chapter 33 gives us a little bit of insight. So we're going to look at that. And I'm going to give you a little context from Exodus chapter 33. If you haven't read the book of Exodus, uh, first off, do you guys get intrusive thoughts like that? Am I, am I by myself or you get some, some of you, who gets intrusive thoughts like that? Okay, okay thank you. Makes me, give someone a high five. We relate to one another. There we go. There, there's a high five. All right. Thank you. But, these, but the Israelites, God's people were enslaved for 400 years under the Egyptian rule. 400 years. They, they're just they're being used and abused for 400 years. And then God raised up Moses. 
he empowers Moses, anoints him to bring those, those people out of slavery. And, and he brings, there's these miraculous events that happen, he, including the ten plagues and then the parting of the Red Sea as the Israelites escape from, from the Egyptians as the army was coming in to attack them. So they, they cross over on the, from the Red Sea and they're wandering the desert. And they're trying to figure out who they are. They're a free people, but they're trying to figure out who they are. They, and God said, I've got a land that I've promised for you. They're, they're heading towards the promised land. And, and through the process, they're learning to become a nation. They're gaining their culture. They're understanding who they are. That's where they receive their ten, the Ten Commandments. They're beginning to gain their identity. And they're learning to trust in God as they move around, move around in the desert and the wilderness. Right? And in the process, there's, they got all these ups and downs. And sometimes they grumble and complain. They say, man, I think it was better when we were in, in Egypt. And they grumble. And then sometimes they get it right and they start listening and trusting God some more. And then other times they, they make an idol, a false god, and they start to worship that. Right? So they had all these ups and downs. And then we know from the story it, it took them 40 years to get to the promised land. They only had to travel 400 miles. It would have taken them about 11 days to, to get there. So can you imagine? Like for us, we know in retrospect, we read the story, we know how it, how it ends. But for them, imagine living that out. You're, you, we were promised this land. We, prom, we were promised all these things from God. And we're stuck out here. It's only supposed to take us 11 days to get there. But we're still out here years and years later. Can you imagine? Right? That messed with their faith. And I think that's where we get stuck sometimes is if the things that God has promised or the things that we thought were supposed to happen don't happen right away, we struggle. What is God's plan? Did you, God, did you change your mind? Did I mess up? Well, sometimes we do mess up and sometimes things shift a little bit. But, but when God's promises are there, he's going to keep them. They messed up as they navigated through the wilderness. But along the way, I think God knew that they would mess up. They learn how to trust God and they trust Moses in the process. And I think that's the point, is being people who are fully surrendered. So the question to, or, or the answer to the question, what do we do when we don't see God's plan for us unfold the way we thought it would? We're going to look at Exodus 33, verses 12 through 17. Okay, we're going to read there and then we're going to get, get maybe, maybe learn some things from, there's a lot there, but... I'll I'll start. It starts out this way. One day Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me I know you by name and look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your way so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. And then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on, on, me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you and I know you by Name. That's good. So the answer, and if you want to, I'll give you the answer right now. And if you want to get up and go grab waffles or whatever, the, the answer is just one sentence. In God's presence, we find his peace by following his plans and trusting his promises. A lot of P's in there. His presence, his peace, his plans, his promises. If we look at the if we look at the like the season that we're living in right now, we look at the world around us right now. There, there, like we're, we don't. I guess we kind of do live in a desert, but there's there is a desert in a way that we live in, and there's a wilderness that we live in—a wilderness and a desert of of information and confusion and chaos and division and all these things. There's and then there's a wilderness of so many different options that sometimes we get dried up. There's so many options. You walk into a grocery store, how many different cereal brands are there? Not enough cereal brands, okay. 
But there's a dryness in us because we keep going to different wells, thinking that it's the living water when it's not. And we hope that this is the living water when it's not. And we, and we end up being dried up inside. There's a desert in here. And just think about the, the amount of information out there and, 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 or, or the way to connect with other people. But there, there, is more, there are more ways to connect with other people now than ever in the history of humanity. Yet, a lot of people are alone. It's hard to handle all that information, so we feel dried up. All kinds of options, all kinds of directions. How many different career paths are out there, young people? How many different class choices? How do we choose our friends? How do we choose who we date, right? What do we, what do we, what do we consume as information? What do we read and listen to? Right? What path do I take? In the wilderness, it's hard to know which way to go. So, what's important is that we stay in God's presence. Everyone, everyone say, stay in God's presence. Right? It's his presence, his peace, his plans, his promises. I love how the passage starts. One day Moses said to the Lord. He was communicating. He was in the presence of God. He was talking to God. The verse right before that. At the end of the last passage, it says, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. We cannot be in God's presence without having a relationship with him. If we want to know we're in the right place in life, it starts by being in the presence of God. A lot of times people think that Moses, his main job was to lead the people. His main job was not. That That was an overflow. That was a result of his being close to the Lord. A lot of people think that, he, well, he, he was leading the people. That was his job. No, his job was to be close to God, being in the presence of God. I want to tell you guys something. The most important thing that you do is not to be a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife. The most important thing that you are and that you do is you're a seeker of God's presence. Because from that space, you'll lead those other things well. The most important thing that we do is not making a living or providing. I know it sounds backwards, but it's this. That's what we see that life, that what pours out of someone's life, when we, when we allow God to pour into us, there's, there's all kinds of blessing that comes when we, when we live that out. Right? The most important thing that we do is not to be respected or, or liked by others or how smart we are or how successful we are or how healthy we are. We are. That's, those are that is not the most important thing that we do. The most important thing that we do and are is a seeker of God's presence. We stay in his presence. If we look at Moses' life before any conversation that he had, before he had any, any debate with anybody, before he made any important decision, he was in the presence of God. Right? He had, they had all kinds of problems. People were always, always, always grumbling. They are always coming at Moses. All these people had all these, all these fights and compl- all these things that were going on. Right? They, they had too much man. They didn't want manna anymore. Right? You guys heard the song, More Money, More Problems? Right? Back, that came from the song from the Hebrews, Mo Manna, Mo Problems. <laughs> Someone that loves the Bible is like, Angel, I don't know about that one. But they had all these issues and they had all these problems. And they kept coming to him. What was Moses' first response? It wasn't to ponder, to think about it. He fell on his face in prayer. That was his first response. It wasn't to think about it. How am I going to react? How am I going to? No, I'm going I'm to pray about this before I even think about it. And the first thing that I do, the first thing that I do when something comes up, guess what I do? I try and think, how am I going to respond to that person? How do I, how, what's a good email template for that? Or I try to stra- find a strategy or I try to do certain things. I try, to pr- I, I try to process it and ponder it before I go to prayer. And the thing that God wa- is wanting us to move towards is de- a dependence, a complete dependence and surrender. That's what God requires of us. And it sounds a lot. A lot. It feels like, man, that's, that's everything. Well, that's where we receive the fullness of life and joy and peace. 
We're going to face all kinds of situations and trials and relationships and money issues, all these things. And then, and then sometimes we eventually pray. But there's a big difference between praying eventually and praying immediately. Think about all the things that would change if we went instantly into prayer versus thinking and pondering and processing and trying to strategize. I think about that. And when I think about that for me, I would have different level of compassion and grace and wisdom that delayed prayer doesn't bring. There's a big difference between delayed prayer, eventually praying, versus praying immediately. So what happens? What happens when we spend time in God's presence, when we spend time in God's word and prayer and hanging out with people and, and talking about other Christians, talking about how, what God is doing in our lives? What happens when we spend in time in, in time in God's presence is it sets us apart. He sets us apart. We become different. Moses is talking with God and he says, are you going to go with us? Verse 16 says, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. God's being with God made them different. Us being with God makes us different. When they were walking around the, 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 in, in the Old Testament during, during this period, when they are walking around, guess what set them apart? That God sent them a pillar of smoke to guide them during the day and protect them from the harsh sun. And he sent them a pillar of fire to protect them at night and guide them. And people saw this. Other nations saw this. They're like, those people are different. Those people are different. And when Jesus... When Jesus ascended into heaven after he's crucified and buried, he came and hung out for a little bit. He promised the Holy Spirit and he goes to heaven. Guess what? He sends the Holy Spirit to be with us. And those of us that we say Jesus, we say yes to Jesus, guess what? He's present with us. He, he, we're being set apart by his presence. We're different and different is good. If people don't see a difference in us, then maybe we've got to check to see if, if we've been in God's presence. A lot, there's some people who say, I'm a Christian, they believe in God, but, but live like everyone else. And I think that's important to check in our lives. I love a story in Acts chapter 4 where we see Jesus' disciples. They, they're different. They're these ordinary men, but they're, when they begin to talk to people about Jesus, people get healed. And there are all, these, all these people come to the, to the Lord. 5,000 people were added to the church. And so the religious authorities, they, they were concerned. They were threatened by, by this new thing that was happening in the city. And so they questioned the disciples. And it says this in verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Have I been with Jesus? Have we been with Jesus? We're different. And different is good. It changes us. His word changes us. It, being with him changes us. Kids, since you're in here, I want to get a little message for you guys. When your parents are, are not wanting to go to church, maybe that's not a whole lot of people. When your parents are not wanting to go to church, say, hey, no, we're different, mom and dad. And we're being made in the likeness of Jesus. We're set apart. We're indifferent as good. We're different and different as good, okay? Can I get an okay from you guys? Kids? Oh, yeah. That was not a kid. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I, need a, I need to call the safety team or security team to come and figure out what that was back there. But, <laughs> but being made in the likeness of Jesus is, is this greater commitment to love and compassion and generosity, taking steps of faith. Walking the gifts that God has given us. It's a greater community or a greater commitment to community and humility and truth. Right? That's how we unleash hope in the tri cities and beyond by loving God, loving people, and living like Jesus, being made in the image of Jesus, being, being made in the likeness of Jesus. Right? With, with the Israelites, the nation of Israel, again, they, they were being developed as a nation. They're beginning to acclimate to their identity that God had set for them. And they're receiving truth, they're receiving direction. They're being set apart. It doesn't just happen. We are sealed in Christ, but, it, but this being set apart thing t- takes a while. And it, you'll have to, we'll, we'll have to debate on the words that I'm choosing right now. But remember this. Remember this. All they ever knew was oppression and abuse and negativity. 
for, for 400 years. And now God is saying, I made you, I love you, I chose you, I have plans for you. It, that, that mindset of abuse and oppression doesn't go away right away. Right? They were, they were starting to learning, they were starting to have this growth mindset. They, they were beginning to dream for the first time. They were beginning to actually experience joy for the first time. And they were adopting these life-giving truths about who God is and about who they were. And they were understanding the world a little bit better. Guess what? It took, it, they, left, they left Egypt. It took, took them a, one day to leave Egypt. But it took them 40 years for Egypt to leave them. Guess what? We're, we're the same. Sometimes Egypt is stuck here. And we have to let God work the stuff out of us. Right? We, when we're following Jesus, we recognize that we've been rescued, we've been brought out of slavery, that we have ex- existed in oppression and abuse of our own making sometimes, and sometimes other, others brought upon us. So we carry this pain and this guilt and this shame, and it takes time for that stuff to come out and work itself out. And it doesn't work itself out. We have to, we, we have to, we have to be aware of it and let God do something in us. We're, we are a new creation, but it takes time for us to grow. It doesn't happen overnight. It reminds me of when I was dating Laura um, just a little bit ago. <laughs> we been married. It will be we, 20 years next May. We were dating. I was 24. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> She's put up with me for that long. Give her a hand. Thank, thank you. <laughs> but we, so we were, we were, we were dating, and I was, um, I was heading over to her house, her, her parents' house, and I was going to say hello to them before I went to, to my house. I was, I was going, I was going to, I was getting off work, heading to my house, but going to stop there for a little bit, say hello. And on the way there, I'm driving and I'm listening to this radio program by a guy named, or John Eldridge was, was, was doing something. And he wrote this book, Wild at Heart. And they were talking about, and th- this book is, is called Wild at Heart, Discovering the Secret Soul of Man's Soul. It's really powerful. Our, our, my group is going through this right now. It's really good. It's helpful for us. But, but they were talking about this wound that we carry, this father wound. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'm a new creation in Christ. Why do I have to deal with any of this stuff? And I was kind of a new believer during that time as well. But, it, but, but I hear about this wound, and he talks about it for half an hour. I get to the house, and I'm hanging out with the family. And then I'm getting, as I'm getting ready to leave, Stu, Laura's, Laura's dad, gets up, and he gives me a hug, and he says, I love you, man. And I, I was like, wow, I'm never, I was like, uh, yeah, brah, you know, like, <laughs> I was like, because I never really heard, I'd never heard that before. Like someone, and then, and, and it's something, it just struck something inside of me, right? And so then uh, I say goodbye, I walk out, and as soon as I walk, I start walking down the steps towards my car, I just lose it. I start crying. Something hit me, and I start crying. And it wasn't just like, like, you know, just a little tear. It was like, Full on, I had to sit down because I was going to fall over type of crying. You know what I'm talking about, like the ugly crying? Like, have you, you know what I'm talking about, ugly crying? Like, ugly crying, all boogers coming out, like, ugly, like bubbles, bubbles were coming out. Like, just like, just losing it for like 30 minutes. And I'm like, just, just go, just right there on the curb. Laura comes out, she sees that I'm still out there, and I'm just ugly crying, that mess all over. She's like, what's wrong? And I couldn't even say the words. I couldn't even say it. I said, he, he told me he loved me, and I just, it was terrible. I thought she was going to break up with me. <laughs> Guys, young men in here, you know you got a real one when they put up with that. You know you got to real. Don't manif- don't don't like don't orchestrate it so it happens for you. Just like let it. If it's gonna happen, if you're gonna ugly, ugly cry, let it be like a genuine ugly cry. Okay. I keep looking over here because. I, <laughs> sorry, sorry, brother. <laughs> sorry, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dang it. I'll look at other young men. There's a couple. Okay, I'll just. 
I don't even know where I'm at in my notes. Anyway, I, I say all that because it, it's taken years. It started then. I think it started even before then. But, it, but it, a lot of the bulk of the work that God's been doing in my life started years and years ago. And it's, been take, it's taken a long time for that part of Egypt to leave. Right, the, the abandonment and the pain and all the stuff that I carried for so long, it takes a long time. I'm still working on it. I go to celebrate, celebrate recovery on Wednesdays. It's amazing. Woohoo! There's one, one other in here. How many of you are in, in celebrate recovery in here right, right now? It's good to look at a couple hands back there, right there, right there, right there. All right. It's a great thing. We work on our hurts, habits, and hangups. It's powerful. But it takes time to be set apart. And what happens when we're being set apart is we follow his plans. We, begin to, we, we, we start to follow the plans that he has for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says this, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we could do the good things he planned for us long ago. And that word masterpiece is a word we get in, in the Greek where we get the word poem. You're, he's writing a beautiful po- poem through your life. He knows you. He has plans for you. And that scares some people sometimes. God has plans for me. I don't know. What if I don't like the plans that God has for me? Right? And I want to make you a promise with this. I want to make you a promise with this quote from C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. Kids, get, read this book. Have your parents read this book, these books to you. Right? Susan is talking with Mr. Beaver about meeting Aslan, who's the lion, and he represents Jesus. And she's a bit nervous and, 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 and because he's a lion. She's a, she thinks he's, he's going to eat her. And, and he asks, or she asks, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver, he responds, he's not safe, but he is good. I want to leave that there for you. God's plans, I don't know what they are for you. They're not going to be everything that you want it to be. They may not feel safe, but he is good. Maybe you can talk about that during waffles in a little bit. But God has plans for us. And as we follow them, as as he instructs us, which is important that we follow him as he instructs us, not based on our own will and our own direction, but but according to his direction, guess what? We're going to see blessings that come with that. There's a fullness of satisfaction that fulfills our hearts. But it's important that we follow his plans according to his direction. It reminds me of punctuation. It's important to to punctuate things well, right? There's something, like, we have to use punctuation correctly. Otherwise, we mess up a sentence, right? It can change the meaning. For example, like, check this one out. I'm sorry, I love you. Right? I'm sorry, I love you. Well, you mess it up, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I love you. <laughs> right? Punctuation matters. Crap, I love you. Right? right here's another one. Let's cook, Grandma. Here's an, if, you don't, if you forget a comma, you, you have a horrifying thing happening. Let's cook grandma. Right, it's, important to follow, it's important to follow instructions, right? It's not according to our will. It's according to his will. And he leads us and directs us and he sets us apart. And he has, in, he has plans for you and I as individuals. He has plans for us as a church. We're called to see people that are far from Jesus Know who Christ is. We're called to be a safe place for people. We're called to help people that are walking in oppression receive freedom. We're called to help people's marriages heal. Kids grow up with a strong identity in Christ, right? That's that's what we're called to do. We're called to follow his plans. We're we're called to to walk according to his will. And that allows us to go into his promises. I've got so much left here, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what, I'm just going to keep going. Is that okay? Kids are doing good. Kids, kids are you good in here? <laughs> that was not a kid again. Okay. <laughs> if, if, we, if we don't spend time in God's presence, what we'll end up doing is we'll, we won't know what direction to take. And sometimes we get swept up by things that might seem good, it might seem like God, but they're not the right thing. Right? We sometimes get swept up by, 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 by things that are like, well, this, se- this seems good, but, but is it God? How we stop to ask the question, is it God? 
Is he leading me? Is he directing me? Right? There's some trends that we've adopted over the years that are just terrible. For example, Macarena. <laughs> How many of you guys did the Macarena? That was, did you regret it? And some of you do not. Okay, what about, what about, what about fanny packs? <laughs> How many of you guys regret fanny? How many of you guys regret them? How many of you guys like them still? Okay, there's a fanny pack over there. You guys like it? Okay, okay, fine, fine. You guys can send hate emails to our men when you're done. What about Crocs? Boo Wait, is this a boot to me or is this a boot to Crocs? Okay, okay, thank you, okay. I was starting to feel, feel insecure. There's a croc. My boys have crocs. Um, what about planking? Everybody, anyone ever do planking? <laughs> right, there's some trends. Like, there's some, people, like, some people thought this was a good idea just to lay somewhere in the middle of the eye. Like this is a thing. People would do this. We swept up, we swept up by the crowd. Like, this is a cool thing to do. <laughs> and many of us, we're trying to figure out God, what are you trying to do in my life? And that's why we're here. And I want to tell you this. God's plan doesn't just pop up. God's plan doesn't just pop up in our lives. We don't discover it all at once. Sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes God does reveal things to us. But, but a lot of times we, 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 we just want it right here, right now, because we live in this microwave kind of a culture and we want instant, instant gratification. And it, it just doesn't work that way. Or we say... Or we think, once I know God's plan, then I'll get serious with him. Right? How many of you have done that? Raise your hand. Don't lie to me. And some of you are like, going like this. Okay. So once, once I know his plan, then I'll get serious. And it doesn't work that way. Most often it requires a long obedience in matters that may not even pertain to the thing that he's calling you towards. He's saying, I want you to be consistent and obedient. I want you to have a surrendered life. I've talked to a lot of people who are living out the, the dream of their, just the dream of their lives. And they stumbled upon it. Because they were walking, they had their head down, they were walking obedient, they were being diligent. They're saying, I'm going to, I'm surrendered to the Lord and maybe it will take me to some amazing place. And then they find themselves living out their dreams. Right, God wants to trust you with what he has for you, so he waits. Right. If we haven't been faithful with the little things, we can't expect him to hand us other things. Right, Jesus says, if you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. I think we forget that God cares more about who we become than what we accomplish. Right? It's more about what he's doing in us than what he's doing through us. I, I told the story of, uh, of Josiah like this past winter where he, he wrestled for the first time. He's a freshman at Richland High. And he, it was a, it's a steep learning curve. It's a steep learning curve to, to wrestle. And so he, he, was a, he was having a hard time. And um, there, there were some matches that were just difficult for him. Right? But one match, he comes over. And I remember, if you guys, I've told you the story, but I forgot to tell you the, the most important part about this. One match, he comes over. He says, hey, Dad, I'm going to lose this match. Remember this? I'm going to lose this match. And I said, but don't talk like that. Why are you, why are you saying that? He goes, well, I'm, I'm wrestling Jesus. Right? His the kid's name is Jesus. Right? So, so he's, I'm wrestling Jesus and I don't want to beat up Jesus. I love Jesus, Dad. And so we get a good laugh. He goes in, in the match and he pins the guy right away. He cradles the guy and he runs over. He goes, Dad, I cradled baby Jesus. Right? So it was funny. But, but the best part was when we're driving home, when we're driving home, he said, um, it was fun to win, but I didn't learn much. It's more important who he becomes than what he does. Right? It's cool to win. I keep telling you, yeah, just keep winning, though. You might learn, keep learning things, but just don't lose too many times. You don't want to have just a puff, puffed up head, right? But as we spend in God's presence, we get a clear understanding of his plans for us and our purpose. And in the process, we experience his promises. I'll have the worship team come up. We experience his promises. And, and his promises we experience along the way, not at the end, not like after we've got all these things right. It's not about getting things right. It's just saying I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to walk this out. And along the way we experience God's promises, right. We, 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 get, we get to have his peace in our lives as we walk in obedience. 
We, we get his presence in our lives. We get his provision and protection and power to overcome. We get love and forgiveness and favor, right? In verse 17, it says, The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you and know you by name. Right, so we get this relationship. And so I, think, I feel like someone needs to hear this. He tells, he tells Moses, he says, I know you by name. God knows you by name. Think about that for a moment. Some of you, someone in here needs to know that and hear that today. He knows you by name. He sees you. He sees the pain you've gone through, you're going through. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. You're going through doubting and, or confusion or there's guilt or there's shame. You're not alone knows you by name. And along the way, as we walk in obedience, God begins to give us his promises, fulfills those things. You know how many promises are in the Bible? If you do a study on the number of promises in Scripture, do you know how many there are from God to humans? There's over 7,400 promises. It doesn't mean that life's going to be easy. In fact, walking with Jesus is not, is not easy, but it's worth it. There will be uncertainty. There will be loss. There will be grieving. You'll be, a lot of times you'll wonder, God, where are you? And he says, keep going. It says in verse 14 that he'll give us rest and he'll be with us. He says everything will be fine. The great uh, philosopher Gabe Esquivel, age 11, he said, in regards to keep going, keep moving, right? God says, keep going. In regards to that, he says, if you feel like nothing is going right, try going left. <laughs> Isn't that good? And I love what Julian said when we were on our trip to New York. He said, he said even small goal, goals can make a big impact over time. Just keep going. Keep going, right? Keep going. Keep going. I think someone needs to hear this in verse four, verse 10 of Isaiah says, don't be afraid for I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Keep going. God's got you. Keep going. Amen. Yeah, you, you guys can clap. It's like a weird like mixture. If you guys want to clap, clap. Like, if you guys want to say amen, say amen. You don't have to be able to. There you go. Thank you. Let's go ahead and stand up. We'll close. We'll receive communion here. In God's presence, he sets us apart. And he fulfills his promises as we live out his plans. And now we get to go eat waffles in a little bit.